St. Charles High, this is Dean Chapman and Libby Lewis, here today in the Crow's Desk to talk about winter break and finals. This is Dean from the future, aka in the editor's room. We go on a wild tangent and don't talk about finals, so big apologies. We end up talking about winter break even though it's January now, we are still working out how editing works, so please, be patient with us. But first... Dean? Yes. What type of pets do you have and what are their names? Okay, so I have six dogs between two houses. Okay. At my mom's house, I have Max, who is a mutt, Buddha, who is like a pit bull lab mix, and then um, Roxanne, who the name of her breed slips out of my mind, but she has really pointy ears. And she is just like a chaos demon who does not age. She's like nine years old, and she is like vicious at tug of war. Does she look like a mini Great Dane kind of, but no, skinnier? No, 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 oh, no. I thought you were talking about those real fast dogs. No. <laughs> oh, um, I know what you're talking about, like Jenna Marbles, her dogs. Yes, mm, yes. Not exactly, but she has the pep in her step. <laughs> at my dad's house... There is um, Lizzie Lou. She is crazy. <laughs> and then Bo, B O, love him. Love him to death. And then, oh my gosh, I am not forgetting her name right now. Tessa. <laughs> Tessa, she is a Great Dane and she has two different colored eyes. Mm. And then I have two horses at my dad's <laughs> named Kane and Dottie. They're both Mustangs. Yeah. I've always wanted a horse. You don't. Really? They're a lot of work. I know, and there's so much money. Oh, yeah. Um, And then a bunch of chickens who don't have names. (laughs) They just have chickens. Yeah. Um, But then, like, one of them died. Oh. Yeah, it got eaten by, like, a raccoon. Yeah, there's a lot of that happens. And then the other three, like, my mom just got tired of taking care of them after like so long so we just got rid of them oh but that's okay yeah it's all right my my dad is like a farmer wannabe (laughs) so he has we have like a huge like chicken coop and we got two we have like uphill where the horses usually stay and then we have like a pen downhill where that's where like they work the horses and stuff but yeah do you have pets um yes i have one dog, her name's Penny, and she's she's a mutt, but she's this, like, white Australian cattle dog mix, mm. and she's so freaking just, ugh, <laughs> so adorable. And then I have my cat, Biff, he's a black cat, mm-hmm. and he's a psycho, but he's really cute and adorable. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I've always wanted a pit bull. My mom won't let me get one, though. Yes. I have, like, a bunch of things. siblings. Oh. Oh, my gosh. But, but they're sweethearts. I know. I told. I tried telling her that it's not about the dog. It's about the owner before. But yeah. she said that I can get as many pit bulls as I want when I'm older. just on her house. <sighs> so that's a plan. Hmm. <laughs> Should we get, like, into what yeah. we're supposed Let's to talk into- about? <laughs> So, the topics are about finals and winter break, as it is rapidly approaching. Um, First thing that I want to talk about is just the schedule change. Because I feel like even though we already... Wasn't last year the first time? Yeah. Last year being 2020, for those who might be listening to the future. Um, That was the first time that our finals was not before winter uh, break. It was in January. And I still feel like all of us are still kind of reeling from that. And I don't necessarily know why they did change it. I think it has to deal with having school start later in August. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's so much information that we have to remember over break. And... I don't even know. Yeah. What are your thoughts? I 
Well, I mean, it's only like a week difference. So I feel like if we really wanted to, we could just do it part of before winter break. But I don't really mind it because, well, this year I'm not taking any of my finals. But last year was just like a hard year and I was taking harder classes, I guess. And so having the time over break to study more and, you know, kind of get on top of my classes was a nice little thing to have. Yeah. Um, but I can see why it would be like really hard. It didn't really matter to me. It was fine either way. Yeah. So, I mean... I feel like, though, there's only such a small percentage, and maybe we could talk about this in the future, about study habits. Mm -hmm. There's only such a small percentage of students who genuinely know how to study and know that it's not quickly looking over your study guide right before you take the test. Right. So because of that gap, although there are some students who do benefit from having it after winter break, that's such a small portion that I feel like a, a lot of the student body gets left in the dust. But, I, you know, I don't necessarily think that's on us, and I don't necessarily think that's, like, on the school. I think finding study, teaching study habits, finding study habits that work for you is, like, it's a lot of working outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I think being super-duper academically burnt out makes you go okay so then why do I go home mm -hmm. and then I have to study more I yeah I almost feel like it's um trying to encourage students to just keep A's in the class and have their attendance up because if you have an A you can exempt and you won't have to deal with it at all you know like this year I'm exempting all the classes I have to take finals in and so I'm like, all right, like, let's get into winter break. Like, I'm ready, but it sucks for some students, like, especially sophomores and juniors, I feel like, because those classes are the hardest. It, it depends on what classes you're taking, but those are the classes where you kind of get to choose more of what topics you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything starts becoming honors or yeah, excelled. Yeah. Rather there's nothing worse average. there's nothing worse than going into class and being like hey can we exempt the final and then your teacher's like no you're not going to be able to i just had that yesterday oh uh, it's like just a bunch of bricks just like went onto my shoulders and i was like are we really about to do this right now and that's that's the struggle of like the honors path is that half the time you're not going to be able to exempt which i i might understand like the spring semester being able to or not being able to because especially if you have eocs if you have you know like the ap test or all these different tests or some sort of standardized issue having that practice of a final might help but you know if it's fall semester and there's no sort of impending doom of a standardized test in sight i just feel like you're wearing down students more by forcing them to take this final but in college you have to take all of your finals no matter what so it's like it's really hard to gauge that balance. But high school isn't college, yeah. you know, and not everyone's going to go to college like how you have to for high school. They need to make it. I don't want to say they need to make it less for everyone, but they need to change something for it to they be need to okay. accommodate. Yes, for everyone. And I think that with honors classes, it makes the people that are in it feel pressure. Mm -hmm. That they have to be this, they have to be that, they have to do good. And then the people that aren't in it feel bad about themselves. Yeah. And, like, I took um, a college class my sophomore year. I took AP European History. Mm -hmm. And that class was so hard. It was, I don't know how people got good grades in there. It was so hard. I didn't even understand, like, what happened. I remember learning about the Renaissance. Yeah. And that was it. Because it was just too much for me. And mm -hmm. because I'm a, what, 15-year-old trying to take a college class. Like, sometimes it's not, it's not going to work. Yeah. 
And I don't think that feeling the pressure that I have to be college smart as a young teenager is fair. Yeah. And I, I know I'm not the only one that's experienced that. So I think that, I don't know, I feel like going into an honors class, you should get like reviews or a summary of what you're getting yourself into. If you're capable of getting, like, handling it. Honestly, like, I feel like a lot of our syllabi, or the syllabus that you get in the majority of your classes, when you're in college, they have to put every assignment, everything that you're learning, because you're paying for that class. Mm -hmm. And I wish that sort of transparency trickled down to high school. Because as much as, you know, having the standard don't cheat on your tests, like a page of the paper, having the unit calendar in the first of every unit isn't enough. Like, I really want that transparency in the, in the beginning. And I understand that a lot of times things change. You Teachers get sick. They have a sub. That means that maybe you're watching a video. Maybe you're just doing notes by yourself. And that changes things a little bit. That's fine. That's like a daily occurrence. But overall, having that transparency of, is this level too fast for you? Is this honors course too much for you? Is it too little for you? I remember I took World Civ instead of AP World. And although I think that if I did take AP that year, it would have been terrible for my mental health, Mm -hmm. I also was insanely bored. Because it was such a slow class. And I hate that there's only two extreme polar options. There's either be in the easy class, not be stressed out, but be bored out of your mind. Or feel insane pressure to do good and do these super duper hard classes that you are only barely passing because you barely understand it. Yeah. Yeah. We hit that on the head. Yeah. (laughs) I'm really passionate about it because it sucks. Yeah. It sucks. I think school has always been a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt stupid or not smart enough. And being a girl and growing up with a bunch of high school boys in your ear saying horrible things to you Mm -hmm. doesn't make it easier. And I think... I wish that school would have been more of a safe environment than a competition. I feel like a lot of it is about being the smartest, being the most athletic, being the most popular, whatever, when it's like, I'm just here to get my education and then never come back. Yeah. Like, I just wish it would have been more about that and maybe making a community than toxicity. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Well, I have two things. I want to talk about class rank. And then, well, okay, I forgot the second part. So we're, we're going to talk about <laughs> class rank. Okay. I'm glad that we, we as school took class ranks out entirely. But as I'm signing up for scholarships and as I'm looking at colleges and stuff, when I was applying, there's so many that are asking for your class rank. Like, it says, you know, what is your GPA class rank? And it's, it's like, what does that matter? What does it matter how I shaped up next to the other students in my school or in my grade? Why is that going to possibly factor into whether I get into this college or not? Whether mm-hmm. I get into the scholarship or not? Well, and I understand, like, the more intelligent you are or educated, the more success you're going to have. But I think that it's unfair to take that education away from a teenager when we don't even know what careers we're going to have yet. We don't even know what our life is going to pan out to be. Yeah. Nobody, like, oh my gosh. Like, my mom is a nurse, and she was a straight C average student in high school. And she's a really good nurse. She's good at her job. She did great in college. And then she was averaging seats. You know what I'm saying? It's just like it doesn't matter in high school. Everyone thinks it does, but it doesn't. And I wish that it could be different how we look at that. Because the ranks don't matter. Yeah. I don't care about them. I don't even know what mine would be, honestly. 
Yeah. I remember my second point is that a lot of people talk about how, or my dad, Mm -hmm. a lot of the times, every time I hang out with him, the conversation is always about, you know, public school doesn't teach you anything. You're going to go into the real world and that's where you learn your lessons. But I want to argue that as much as people want to say that school is just an academic environment, no, it is not. If anything, it is the number one place where you're learning how to socially navigate situations. For sure. Like last episode, we talked about how, you know, now that when I deal with certain situations and drama Mm -hmm. or with friend groups, I'm like, oh, I dealt with this five times. I know what to do. Mm -hmm. That is the most important because you're probably going to have to deal with those same situations, change a little details, and suddenly, you know, you're in a box office dealing with the same thing. Or you're in a fast food restaurant run by all teenagers and you're dealing with the same thing. Mm -hmm. So as much as the the class time and the working on papers and getting the grade matters. It's also the passing period, the whispering in the halls, the interacting with students in AIP and like getting to know yourself, getting to know others, how to socially interact. That is probably the biggest part of high school. I think the, Racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia that is in our school, not because it's our school, just because it's part of our society as a whole, Mm -hmm. is disgusting. Yeah. In my opinion, I think that it is so hard to hear people say those things and then not be able to do anything about it. And I, I know, like, some people might think, like, So I'll stand up for them, stick up for them. As much as I would like to do that, if it's a group of people and I'm the only one, how do you think this is going to turn out? Yeah. It's about being the strongest or the most superior. And some people will do whatever they need to do in order to get there. Yeah. And I would, not that I would rather not stick up for the people that I think deserve equal rights, but I would rather just be quiet and mind my own business, which I hate Yeah, because I shouldn't have to choose that. I should be able to stick up for myself and other people, but it makes it so hard when nobody's stopping them. It's a game of chess because if you were to stand up for them, then it's like, okay, now these people think you're an inconvenience because now every time that they say something bigoted, you are going to say something and they're just going to be like, ugh, and they're not going to learn themselves because a lot of people who are saying these rude and mean things and these ignorant things won't have a conversation with someone of that minority that they are hurting. I've definitely, like as a trans person, as a queer person, have had to navigate standing up for myself, standing up for others, while also maintaining basically my alliances. Some people will get really, really upset if you try to bring an adult into the situation. I'm not looking to get into a fist fight, so of course I'm going to tell an adult. How exactly is that going to change when I'm out in the world and suddenly I am the adult. There's so many HR managers or higher ups in businesses who simply do not care or will turn a blind eye to ignorance and bigotry simply because they're probably not paid enough to. I can empathize with not wanting to say something and then hating yourself for it. Because the people that don't have a voice, you know, you want to help them. But I don't necessarily have a voice either. You know, it just kind of depends on everything. You know, everything is a factor. I just wish that things could be different. I say that to myself constantly. I just wish it could be different. 
No. Because there's nothing really changing it. I don't personally have any control over it, but I can do the best. I, you just have to cope. Yep. You have to cope. And that's really the only thing you can do because if you don't cope, then it eats you alive. Yeah. It kills you. You know, it destroys the person you are. And nobody wants that. And I don't think that, like, I mean, unfortunately, you're never going to know the butterfly effect of what you're going to say and how that's going to affect people and what doors are opening and what doors are closing after you say that. But if you're in a situation, and I think school and society in general, you're going to be in an environment where you are just going to have to deal with people that are not like you and will hurt you and who are just plain mean. If that means they become an inconvenience to you, but that means that you help that one person or you help yourself feel better or feel validated, then sometimes it's just worth having like a pain in your side the rest of the time. Because is it worth the inconvenience or is it worth the guilt that you feel not knowing that you stood up for yourself or that one person I definitely hope to see like out of myself from now on I see myself like becoming better every single day improving and that's my biggest thing is just making sure I keep improving and seeing progress And I hope to see myself, I know I'm a kind person. I think that I'm kind to everyone I interact with. I can't remember a time that I was rude to someone I didn't know because that's horrible. I don't want to do that anyway. But I hope that when I see those types of interactions, I can speak up and use my voice for good instead of being a bystander. Because it's not like I'm trying to be a bystander. It's not like I'm trying to avoid the situation and make it worse. It's just that I'm not a person that likes confrontation. I'm not a person that likes conflict at all. It makes me feel horrible. Mm -hmm. But I think that I need that to be able to grow as a person. Because I can't run away from it my whole life. Exactly. And as we're growing older... Especially now that we're this age, how many people are going to, like, try and hurt me? Because I said, hey, don't say that. That's mean. You know? (laughs) Like, no one's going to punch me in the face for that or, like, send me death threats. At least I hope. Yeah. I hope. I think confrontation has... I've had a journey with confrontation. Hey, guys. Sorry if this sounds super put together. It's because it is. (laughs) We got cut off of filming, but we were talking about confrontation and being a bystander. And we left off with saying that I have many a story about confrontation. And I think that ties in with, and I mean, I've been saying this for the past two episodes about I've dealt with this situation five times. Mm -hmm. Now I know how to handle it. And a lot of that just comes with confrontation because high school is mean, but middle school is far meaner. Like, that is a, when a lot of social groups and your cliques and your friend groups are created. And that's, that's where you learn to deal with these situations. Because I was in an all-girl group. There was girl drama. And there was also a lot of confrontation. And then there's also a lot of passive aggressiveness. And through those experiences, I've been able to become okay with confrontation sometimes it, it, it makes you feel panicky no matter what it's just overall something out of your comfort zone because you're being called out on something or you're calling someone out on something but you have to be okay with it because it's like okay just own up to your actions to whatever happened you know feelings are feelings you feel a certain way they feel a certain way mm-hmm. and there's no control over that but it's how you how you take the situation and how you react to it. No, yeah, that's basically really all I have to <laughs> um, I just I hate confrontation. Yeah. So much. It makes me like 
it makes me feel so vulnerable. Yes, and I get so anxious, and I feel like I'm getting attacked, Mm -hmm. or like I have to defend myself, and I don't like doing that. Yeah. (laughs) And so, I mean, I think I've gotten better at it the Mm -hmm. older I've gotten, or the older I've gotten. I think that it stems from like something from my childhood. Mm -hmm. We don't have to talk about that today. Yeah. But I just don't like people criticizing me either. Or, like, I don't like getting yelled at. I don't like when people are angry or mm. anything negative towards me. Yep. And so I just start freaking out. I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, they I also, me, you know. I feel that, too, because I, I will kind of do anything to smooth over a situation if... <laughs> if it's something negative on me, but it's not that I want to be seen as someone pristine or whatever who would never hurt a fly, because that's not true, but (laughs) (laughs) it's not, and that's just being human, but I don't want my relationships to be, like, diminished because I screwed something up. Yeah, you care about that person. Yeah, I care about that person, and so... I will try honestly to look from their situation, but I also feel like there have been times, and this is my own fault, and probably something I should talk to my therapist about, um, where I didn't necessarily feel sorry about a situation, or I really didn't feel like I did something that bad, but I still apologize for it because I wanted that connection to still be as solid. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's kind of messed up. But the first step to, like, noticing those things is noticing it and then changing for the better. So it's a matter of self-reflection. I am a big, fat people pleaser. Mm. I've always been, like, when I was, even, like, a year ago, like, a couple months ago, I was like, I'm a kind person, like, I'm a good person, I'm nice to people, blah, 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 but there's a difference between being kind and being a people pleaser, and I was definitely a people pleaser, because I just let people walk all over me, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just let people walk all over me, and, and people pleasing doesn't have to be with, like, strangers or with friends, it's 100% with family members. If anything, it, I feel like it's totally worse when it's with family members. And the holidays only exacerbate that even more. I have a very low social battery, and I always communicate with my family that, like, hey, like I've, I really need to recharge. I need to go in my room. But sometimes over winter break and the holidays, like, there, you just, you can't because you have to sit there with your family and open presents and have breakfast and then you have to hang out with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's like five to six hours. Plus you did another, like it's gonna be 12 hours for me on Christmas Eve. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to function. Like that's so much social interaction and so little time to just chill. Mm -hmm. And when, I say my battery is low, like, I really do, like, stop talking, but then if I go way too far with not having to, like, recharge, then I just go crazy. (laughs) I start saying the stupidest things, and I just, like, I'm trying to self-regulate my emotions, but it's just, it doesn't come off in, like, a way that people understand. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, let me go home. Yeah, let me go home, please. I totally agree. I'll like kind of run off and be like in the bathroom for a second and I'll just like sit in there and just chill, yeah. play on my phone or do something like that because it is hard like being around that many people, especially after like, I feel like if you think about COVID, if you think about just, I feel like as you get older, you realize that your family isn't exactly how you pictured it when you were younger. Mm-hmm. And so as you mature, you have to talk about other things or you have to, you know, do other things or somebody else talks about or does other things. And it just changes for us at this time in our life. I feel like it changes. And I hate being like that and saying, I 
don't want to be around my family yeah all the time every second of winter break or holidays because some people don't get that at all yeah and I hate not being grateful for that because I love my family Mm -hmm. but I think that it's just it's human to need alone time just as human as it is to need other people yeah like social um situations so I think as long as you can find the balance but thinking about we just went we just had Thanksgiving yeah and my thing it was fine it was whatever but now we have to go into Christmas and I don't know about you but I'm gonna have to travel to go see my dad Mm, yeah and that's always hard you know just like not being at home not being in your own space like being in uncomfortable my dad doesn't make me uncomfortable but it's just it's farther away he just moved and so like I've never been there before it's like a new area new environment Mm -hmm. and so going into that it gives you anxiety I think that a lot about holidays and especially Christmas gives you anxiety getting presents spending alone time like some people struggle, they can't get away from their families, and then some people wish that they could find friends to go sledding with or, mm. you know, drink hot chocolate, things like that. You know, you just got to find the balance, and if you don't, whatever, I guess. I mean, yeah. just go back into school, and... And then that'll be that. Yeah. You have to, you have to <laughs> wait sucks. another 11 months. I think you have to take advantage of what your options are if that makes sense what your choices are because if you're going to be around family then use it to get closer to them or to be nice to them yeah or, you know whatever and then if you're not use it to try and reach out to new people and hang out with new friends or ask one of your guardians or your mom or your dad to do something nice with them it can be something at home that doesn't cost anything yeah. you know do a puzzle. Exactly. It can be something Watch so simple show. that means so much. I talk about that all the time. It's the little things. Yeah. And I feel like Christmas is definitely about the little things. Yeah. You just reminded me that I have to travel for the first time. And, like, I was thinking that I had to travel to my dad's, which is, like, you know, just, like, an hour away. But mm-hmm. I have to go to Cape Girardeau this year. Mm. And it's like two hours. Yeah, and that's at my old grandparents' home, and I haven't seen that since I was in middle school. And yeesh, that brings up like a lot of a lot of feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also not having that like safe space of like your room or just like being in your own home, and like you don't know what food is gonna be there, so you don't yeah. know what you're gonna be able to eat, and that's gonna be so stressful but you know it is about like serving what you have and then saying okay you know I could always go in the bathroom to chill for a little bit Mm -hmm. I know that you know at some point it's just kind of gonna be us sitting around and maybe they can be at the dinner table and I'll just be on the couch chilling like there's always going to be a moment if you truly look that you're going to have a space to breathe Holding on to your affirmations, I feel like, is super important. Being able to tell yourself, it's going to be okay, I can do this, I will get through it, mm-hmm. and I will see the other side of it. Um, another thing, I like what I did when I first went to go visit my dad, is I brought a book. Mm-hmm. And I started reading it, because it looks better than being on your phone, and then people won't keep talking to you if you don't want to talk to someone and then you can still be in front of them or sitting on the couch and as long as you can block everything out without like wearing headphones yeah it'll be fine you don't even have to actually be reading just look like you're reading and like it'll give you a type of room to breathe i can't necessarily mask that well with like a book but um i'm really thankful my that my own family they also prioritize recharging themselves Mm -hmm. we always say like when I come home from school or when mom comes from work if either of us like go up to each other and we're just like let me tell you about my day blah 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 blah. we'll be like I need like an hour to decompress (laughs) yeah I need an hour to decompress and then you can come talk to me and I think a conversation about decompressing should really be had with all families because I don't feel like there's some families who just straight up don't know what that means Mm -hmm. uh, and like don't understand that you know maybe their child does need space not everybody has the energy 
in the extroversion to just go, 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 go. Yeah. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm definitely not an extrovert. I'm definitely an introvert. I like being at home. I like being with selective people. Yes, for sure. And it like still took so long to get to that point where like you are one of the people that I'm fine with being with, you know? Mm -hmm. I feel so comfortable talking about this stuff because I just like have like a feeling that I'm not the only one struggling with this at this school, you know? Oh yeah. I feel like maybe, I mean, we've talked about this, like just like knowing that you're not alone Mm -hmm. in a situation and then also like understanding it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to be vulnerable because if someone came up to me and was like, said something about something I said on here, I'd be like, okay, why are you making fun of my sadness? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, why are you being weird? Like, why are you being, it just shows that they don't want to talk about their feelings, which is fine. You don't have to talk about your feelings if you're not comfortable, but that's your own journey. So let me do mine. You know, I had people, and this is, um, it was very, very sweet. We were talking about how we don't want to get bullied for trying to make this safe space. They were like, you know, I will defend you if someone ever tries to say anything about the podcast. And I was just like, that actually means like a lot because that is something that I worry about. That's very kind of them. Yeah, Yeah. it's really, it's really, really kind of them. (laughs) And that'll always be a point that re that we reiterate again and again is that this is a safe space to. And I feel like safe space is such a buzzword and it has such a bad connotation now, but it really is meant to be a safe space where we can talk about these things and we can be upfront with being like, yeah, the holiday times aren't always the best for me. I struggle a lot. And, you know, some people don't have the words to say that. And if that means that I'm the one who's saying it and then they feel that solidarity that they can keep to themselves, I did my job. I'm okay with that. Nice word. Yeah. Solidarity. I like that. Totally. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I feel like we talk about reality. And that's what I like. It's it's comforting to know that I can sit here with you and talk about things that aren't always good. Mm -hmm. And you be like, yeah, totally understand. You know? And, And not be sad. And not be like... Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I don't want pity. Yeah. I just want someone that can be like, I totally relate to you. It sucks, but we'll get through it. Yeah. You know? And so I feel like that's why I like this is because I feel like it doesn't, it doesn't have any bad points to it. I can't think of a negative thing that this is bringing up. Yeah. And if I get a little hate for it, if you get a little hate, if we get a little hate for it, but it's helping like other people or even just other people like listening to it, whatever. I, like, I like doing it. Mm-hmm. So I'll just, if we got like two views, I'll yeah. still keep doing it, you know? <laughs> even if I'm simply speaking into the void for my own like release mm-hmm. of all this stuff, then okay, so be it. If anything, that's less stuff that I have to talk in therapy. So. You know, (laughs) and I'm being so frank to say that, yeah, I'm in therapy. I've been in therapy for a lot of my life and I'm going to stay that way. But that's something that we also need to like deconstruct and be like, that is normal. If anything, so many more people need to be in therapy. I'm in therapy. Let's go. Yeah. (laughs) But like, that's a conversation that needs to be had. I think everyone should go to therapy. Exactly. I think that it should be part of healthcare, and it should be almost free. Yeah. And I'm glad that my insurance covers most of it yeah. because it is definitely a very positive thing to have. Yeah. And I think that after the holidays, I'm definitely, like, <laughs> the next um, therapy session, I'm going to have stuff to say. Yeah. Thanks I'm going to be was very, a, very busy. Yeah. It was a big topic for us to talk about. Mm-hmm. So it was nice to have someone to kind of take all of that negativity. And it's also a part of decompression. Sometimes decompression isn't 
relaxing. It's processing your feelings and processing what happened in the day. And therapy can be a part of decompressing and really unpacking like what you dealt with. And the holidays are going to be filled with all sorts of emotions, whether that be joy, sadness, grief, anger, or, you know, all sorts, all sorts, a whole variety. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to go just like Skittles and go and arrange the colors and then just kind of be like, okay, let me process this one and pop it in your mouth (laughs) and just do that again until the whole bag's gone. And then you're like, okay. They don't taste as yummy though. They don't taste as yummy. (laughs) My, my, my tummy kind of hurts, but Thank you guys so much for listening. We really enjoy rambling for you guys. Um, And we hope that you have a, you think of an adjective this time. Whimsical. A whimsical day. And as always, go go get them pirates. pirates.